Miller Mahdi from 8451 here. Welcome to another episode of The Upload. We're glad you're here. Each month, we dig into the world of AI, thick data, machine learning, data science. We invite you to stick around and let us know what you think. Keep an open mind and stay curious. Welcome to The Upload by 8451. I'm your host, Dan O'Keefe. And today, we are talking with Brandon Greenwell about automated machine learning, data robot, and open source. So let's start up. First off, thank you, Brandon, for joining us. Welcome to The Upload. Thanks for having me. So for starters, can you tell us how you came to be involved in in the field of data science and how you landed at 8451? And I want to touch on the fact that you're a bit of a celebrity in the field of data science, right? I, I, I wouldn't say celebrity, but... Uh, <laughs> you're known. Uh, to maybe 10 people. All um, right. So, <laughs> so I, uh, I, I started off in uh, applied statistics, um, <clears throat> which at the time I felt data science was sort of emerging as its own sort of uh, field. Um, so early on in my my, my master's work, uh, I was working at a statistical consulting center at Wright State. Mm-hmm. Um, through a project we were working on there, I, I got the opportunity to go to a sort of a one-day short course uh, on data mining by a guy named Dick DeVoe, who's an excellent speaker on the, on the topic. And that was... That was really my first exposure to the the whole algorithmic modeling culture, right. and ever since then, I, I was you know fascinated by the methodologies that they employed, like uh, random forest, tree based methods in general, support vector machines, and so um, you know that that sort of got me into the field of machine learning before it was more formally being taught in the statistics department at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I, you know, I went on, I got my PhD in stats. Uh, um, Beyond that, I, I started to work for the uh, Department of Defense at the School of Aerospace Medicine. Hmm. They were more of a, a traditional research-based organization, uh, re, you know, employing a lot of uh, more classic regression-based techniques. Um, but at the time, there was sort of a push uh, to, to move towards more contemporary methodologies mm-hmm. like machine learning, things like that. Um, and so the team that I was on was, was sort of involved in, in, in embedding machine learning across the, the different uh, projects going on there at the time. There was... You know, a, a bit of a, a pushback, though, because you know the the you know these machine learning methodologies weren't as uh, known to, to to researchers across that organization. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's a bit of a pushback and and not getting results in the form that they were more used to, like coefficients and standard errors and p values, more stuff that they were traditionally right. trained on, and so. Um, that was sort of my my, my first uh, exposure into this this at the time it wasn't really an involving field but uh, something called interpretable machine learning yep. and so these are, are methodologies and tools that that help take the output from from machine learning models and, and uh, convey and explain their output in more of a human understandable format and so uh, you know partial dependence plots uh, provided sort of a happy medium for us and mm-hmm. in, in order to be able to take these models and and, and uh, explain them to our stakeholders at the time. And that's PDP, which we've talked so, about. Yeah, yeah, so partial dependence plots uh, called PDPs. Um, the, the problem at the time was that uh, their availability in terms of software was 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 very small. It wasn't widely available for a lot of different methodologies that we were employing at the time. Um, so, you know, I wrote a lot of code to do this stuff. Um, I got tired of rewriting that code over and over again. And so... Um, after a while, I, I evolved that into sort of a more general package called called PDP. Um, uh, after I felt it was something that would be useful to the, the data science community as a whole, I, I, I put it out on CRAN. Um, ended up becoming a little bit more uh, um, popular than I had expected. I thought maybe like 10 people would download it and use mm-hmm. it. It ended up becoming uh, pretty widely adopted across the... Uh, even you know larger industries and 8451 had it as part of their machine learning toolkit before I even started to work here. It was like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> kudos to you. That's yeah. Great. So I mean that's you know so that's a that's a that's a uh, but it, but it's a it's a useful tool. It's a tool that got me into this this wider field that that's becoming interpretable machine learning right now. Uh, we've written a couple of other packages for that. But anyway. Um, after a couple of years at the School of Aerospace Medicine, uh, which was my first exposure to actually applied machine learning and, mm-hmm. and, and practice, uh, I ended up across the street at uh, the Air Force Institute of Technology. That's where I got my, my PhD. 
I started working in a small uh, data science uh, research lab, which at the time was, was being run by, by Brad Bemke, who's a, a colleague of mine here at 8451. Um, and so that was, that, was a, that was a fun job. We got to do lots of machine learning research, mm -hmm. uh, write cool new R packages, uh, write about them. Um, and so we did that for a while. And then I, I think right around the same time, we, we, we both kind of felt the need to, to you know, spread our wings and, and move on into to industry in general, mm -hmm. see what we can learn there and, and maybe what we can bring as well. Uh, and so maybe maybe seven or eight months after that, we both ended up at, at 8451. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Um, and I, I do want to come back to Brad in just a minute. But first, I want to make sure we understand more uh, or as fully as, as, as we need to interpretable machine learning. Is there any additional explanation or definition of that you'd like to give us? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess everybody probably has their own definition. Uh, you know, to me, in in the simplest terms, uh, I'll just I'll just call it IML for interpretable machine learning, is a a set of tools and methodologies to help explain the output from machine learning models in mm -hmm. a human understandable format, usually in the form of um, interesting graphics and visualizations like gotcha. variable importance plots or uh, things like that. Yeah. So it just makes it easier for everyone to understand what they're right. looking at. Yep. What they're, okay. Yep. Everybody, we, everybody likes graphs. Yeah. There we go. Appreciate that. And now speaking of Brad, uh, Brad Bemke, uh, you are also his co-author in a new book, correct? Yes. Titled Hands-On Machine Learning with R. Yes. Right. I almost wrote that same book, but I'm glad I did. Is that, oh, yeah. It's, Can it's you give one. us some insights into, into <clears throat> the book? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the book, which we actually just finished the, the first draft of, so hopefully that'll, that'll be out by CRC Press later on this year. Um, the, the purpose of the book is to be a uh, provide a, a practical but application driven um, mm -hmm. approach to to learning and building intuition for some of the more useful modeling techniques that are available today. Um, so the idea is that it'll be a, a practical guide to sort of all aspects of the machine learning process. So things like feature engineering, preparing your data, how do you encode categorical variables. Uh, how do you measure generalization performance for your models, model selection, um, and then also interpretability is, is, is a big part. So um, kind of building intuition and, and, and applying all those techniques using um, various tools from ours and incredible diverse open source machine learning stack. So packages like uh, from the Tidyverse for uh, visualization and data wrangling. Um, you know, Keras for fitting complex uh, uh, neural network architectures. Um, uh, H2O for a little bit of uh, automated machine learning, mm -hmm. um, and then packages like Dalek, IML, PDP, VIP for interpreting the output from those models, gotcha. which is makes the book sort of unique, I think, because it's, it's really hard to find one single resource that sort of touches on all these all these all these different components of the machine learning process. And so we're, we're very excited about it. And again, that comes out later this year, you said? That's the idea. Yeah. I, I don't know how long the editing process takes, but yeah, maybe sometime around the, the fall or, or sometime this winter. That's great. And who do you want to play you in the movie? Uh, Keanu Reeves, maybe. All right. All right. Sure, he's out now. Yeah. Somebody with more hair. Uh, and uh, so how, how are automated mm -hmm. machine learning and products like Data Robot, which we mentioned in the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, changing the way data scientists build and deploy models. Sure. Specifically, you know, what impact has Data Robot had um, on the way 8451 works? So, uh, machine learning is a, is a rather involved process. Um, and so, automated machine learning, is, as the name implies, is all about automating various components of that process. Mm -hmm. um, Things like you know that the feature engineering, uh, recommending which validation metrics should be used for a particular projects, uh, model selection, hyperparameter tuning, and things like that. And by automating those components of that process, and some components are easier to automate than others. Um, some shouldn't be automated at all. But by automating a lot of those components, um, allows data scientists of all different skill levels to be able to utilize you know, state-of-the-art predictive technologies to, to help solve their, mm -hmm. their, their prediction problems. Um, and so it sort of democratizes machine learning. Gotcha. And products like Data Robot put that capability into the hands of, of, of data scientists across our organization with a lot of added bells and whistles. And, and mm -hmm. one of the, probably one of the more important is, you know, not only can data scientists at all skill levels employ these models, right, and be able to access them and, and, and build trusted prediction models mm -hmm. um, without necessarily having to know the you know a deep understanding of the underlying methodology, but also the ability to take those models 
and put them into a production process as efficiently as possible using open source tools like R, Python, and Apache Spark. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And then, and what benefits can customers of eighty four fifty one expect to realize as you, you know, continue to adapt Data Robot for your work processes? So, you know, with the the ability for more data scientists across the organization to, you know, build and deploy, you know, better, more accurate models with higher efficiency. I mean, uh, we can, you know, we can expect higher quality results delivered in a more efficient manner. The households, for example, could expect better, more relevant coupons tailored specifically okay. for their household. Interesting. All right, great. And so, what's the timeline look like for how that's all going to? you know, make its way to the consumer? You know, is it happening now? It'll happen in the near future? But that's a, that's a good question. I mean, so, you know, just a, a year ago, you know, we, we had a small handful of, of data robot licenses. Earlier this year, we increased that to over 200. Uh, we just finished uh, maybe a month ago rolling out our, our own internally developed uh, training around data robot. Mm-hmm. And so now that it's becoming more embedded across the machine learning problems that we have here at the company, I mean, you know, months. Gotcha. Great. And then besides data robot, what are some of the other tools available today? Uh, so, well, so data robot was probably my, my first exposure to this, 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 you know, the, the idea of automated machine learning. Mm-hmm. Um, arguably it's, it's definitely probably the leader in this field, mm-hmm. but there's, you know, there's, there's no shortage of, of other, other products available. Largely Pro- open source. Proprietary or? and open source. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, H2O's uh, driverless AI is probably the, the best example of, of another proprietary uh, uh, product for automated machine learning and probably Data Robot's biggest competitor. Um, they're relatively strong in terms of the, the interpretability machine, the, the interpretable machine learning uh, methodologies and then the GPU capabilities that mm-hmm. they, they uh, build into their platform. They, that same company, H2O, also offers uh, open source R Python packages with some automated machine learning capabilities mm-hmm. built into that, although it's rather limited in comparison to, to driverless and, and data robot. And also, uh, you know, the proprietary offerings tend to be a little bit more accessible to people, even with, like with less coding experience by having you know, web applications and GUIs that they can okay. use versus the open source packages it definitely require some coding experience. Um, Auto, Auto SK Learn is, is probably what one of my favorite open source um, implementations of automated machine learning. It's uh, essentially a wrap around uh, SK Learn with some uh, automation and Bayesian optimization baked into it. It's okay. pretty 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 slick package. And you, you kind of touched on um, the fact that proprietary tools are a little bit better, maybe for non coders because of the, the you know user interface. You know they provide. Are there other benefits and drawbacks to either you know open source or proprietary? Sure, uh, sure, and I'm sure other people have different opinions than, than myself. But I like I said, I mean I. I grew up in statistics on SaaS, so I'm, I'm no stranger to having to depend on proprietary software mm-hmm. for my own work. Plenty of fond memories, you know, staying up late in the, you know, the Russ Engineering Center trying to finish my, my SaaS for a homework project that was due the next day. Fond memories. But I mean, that, so to me, that's, that's the biggest drawback of, of proprietary tools is their availability, not just mm-hmm. in terms of price, but, you know, SaaS was something as a student for me that wasn't something I could install on my laptop and it wasn't made available for my operating system gotcha. versus open source tools. They're much more widely available. They're, they're mm-hmm. free. I have direct access to the, the code underneath the hood. I, I can install them on my uh, MacBook, Linux, uh, Windows operating system. So they're much more widely available to, right. to, to people. Um, but the, the biggest drawback for open source is it's, it's not it's not necessarily standardized. It's, it doesn't have as, as, as good as documentation. It's kind of hit or miss. Mm-hmm. If you go and look at any of the packages I have on CRAN, the documentation is probably the worst stuff you'll ever read. Because, <laughs> you know, so it, just, it just depends on who wrote it versus, right. you know, a, a company like, like Data Robot and SaaS, right? Their, their, their documentation is, is incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, and you get first-class customer support along with that as well. So 8451 has a nice robust mix of proprietary and open source. Oh yeah, right? we have, we have yeah. a very diverse machine learning toolkit that, that includes proprietary and, and open source tools. So Data Robot definitely isn't the, you know, the only thing that we use here for machine learning. But, Great. Yeah. So what areas of new development around automated machine learning excite you the most? So there's definitely a lot of cool things happening, uh, and, uh, new developments uh, in automated machine learning, especially around like the automation, the core of the automation process itself. So like mm-hmm. better better hyperparameter tuning and, and hyperparameter searches. But uh, t- to me, I, I think the more exciting development is, is currently happening with, with interpretable machine learning. Okay. Autom- autom- automated machine learning is great. These, these methods put 
you know, the, the, the ability to fit these, these, these state-of-the-art models into the hands of more users at, at different skill levels. But what's the point of being able to fit these models if you can't interpret them and explain their output to your stakeholders? And that's why IML is, is even more important for, for automated machine learning. Right. But automate, so IML itself, I mean, there's plenty of areas just begging for development and scalability is, is probably the most important. We, we have these interpretability tools, but one of the problems that we see is that they don't scale well to large data sets. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's the, even things like, like partial dependence bots. When you start looking at partial dependence bots for more than, more than one feature, it, it quickly becomes a, a, a computationally complex problem. Right. And so I think, I think the, the, the best developments that we're going to see coming out of that are going to be in, in terms of making those methods more efficient and scalable. Well, Brandon, we are done with our questions. We really appreciate everything you've shared about interpretable machine learning and data robot. And of course, we wish you the very best on your book. It's very Thank exciting. Yeah. All right. Um, but we're not done just yet because it is now time for the 8451 lightning round where we ask you a series of eight random questions for 51 seconds. I get 51 seconds per question or uh, <laughs> some folks have needed that, but no, I uh, 51 seconds in total, eight questions. <clears throat> Brandon, are you ready? Yes. Would a heightened sense of smell be a blessing or a curse? A curse. I live with a three and a four year old. If you had to work, but didn't need the money, what would your job be? I'd be fun to be a chef. I think. Do you recycle? If there's a recycling bin nearby. How many times do you look at your phone in a day? Too many. Who will get the first thank you in your book? Probably my parents. All right. Have you ever cried during a movie? And if yes, which movie? Yes, Marley and Me. And that was just during the previews. I'm with you. That was horrible. Was horrible. Uh, in a great way. Clowns, funny, scary, or disturbing? Take them or leave them. What's worse, spiders or snakes? Spiders. All right. That was quick. I think we made it, right? All right. Fantastic. Brandon, success. All right. Thank you to our guest, Brandon Greenwell. I'm your host, Dan O'Keefe, and we will see you next time on The Upload. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Millen here. That's it for this month's episode of The Upload. We hope you enjoyed it and hopefully learned something new. Remember to give us a like and share your feedback. Until next month, stay curious.